All right. Good morning, afternoon, and or evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry this video took so long to make. Um, simply put, Christmas season at work. Enough said. I work at a grocery store, so uh, that's the perspective you need. So if you know even a modicum of NFL history, you know about the thrilling yet tragic tale of Super Bowl 34. The Tennessee Titans were only one yard, three feet, 36 inches, from potentially tying the game and going to the first ever overtime in Super Bowl history. But of course, they were, as the call says, one yard short. Despite a heroic effort from that Titans team throughout the game, throughout the entire playoffs, they had come up second to the St. Louis Rams and one of the most powerful offenses of all time. The greatest show on turf would host Lombardi Hythe in 1999. Super Bowl 34 was a landmark moment in NFL history. It remains the Rams franchise only time they've won the big game. It was coming off of the back of one of the greatest offenses of all time, the legendary receiving duo of Torrey Holt and Isaac Bruce. Marshall Falk's 1,000-1,000 season, 1,000 yards rushing, 1,000 yards receiving. And the rise of Kurt Warner. Of course, the legendary story of the undrafted grocery clerk that went on to become a Hall of Famer. But how were these teams built? What were their expectations going into the year? How did it all turn out for them? Well, let's find out. So if you watched my previous series on the 2004 NBA Championship, this is essentially going to be the same format. We talk about the teams, how they were constructed, how they got there, and then finish up with the game itself and the aftermath. And, uh, well, if you can't tell by the jersey, we're going to start in Tennessee. Roll the intro. I don't really have a good intro right now, but on this channel I like to talk sports. To understand the Titans of 99, you have to go back three whole years to the Oilers of 1996. This would be their last year in Houston, as the demands for a new stadium by their owner, Bud Adams, would fall through. His promise of, build me a stadium or I move the team, would be fulfilled and he would begin looking for a new suitor for the franchise. On the field though, this team would go 8-8. Eight and eight. Of course, their head coach was the master of mediocre, the sultan of serviceable, the generalissimo of just average, Jeff Fisher. That explains a lot. But the team also was in a transition period, to say the least. Two years before, the Oilers had been very bad, 2-14 and 14 levels of bad. And with the third overall pick in the draft that year, the Oilers selected quarterback from Alcorn State University, Steve McNair. McNair was, of course, supposed to be the future of the franchise, but he was not ready, to say the least, and in fact had been riding the bench mostly for the last few years in favor of veteran journeyman Chris Chandler. In 1997, the Houston Oilers would officially become the Tennessee Oilers, as they began looking for a new stadium to play in, they were stuck in the Liberty Bowl in Memphis. McNair's first season as a starter would be in this new cornerstone for the franchise in 97, and he would be... okay. McNair would throw for 2,665 yards, 14 touchdowns, 13 interceptions, while rushing for a further 674 yards and 8 touchdowns on the ground. Their star running back in Eddie George would have 1,399 yards and 6 touchdowns, while their leading receiver for that year would be tight end Frank Wycheck, who would have 748 yards and 4 touchdowns on the year. The team was just sort of... okay, you know? McNair's first season as a starter was not fantastic, as the Titans were the 29th ranked passing offense in the league. However, their offense was the third ranked rushing attack of that year by yards, mainly because of the combination of George and McNair. McNair was always a threat to scramble, and his very powerful running style combined with his large and well-built frame meant that he was more than willing to take hits and absorb hits other quarterbacks couldn't or wouldn't. McNair's prominence on the ground would help out the running game immensely, especially with it being led by the immensely talented Eddie George. While McNair needed time to develop, George's arrival was instant. 
The then-division rival Pittsburgh Steelers would beef up their own running game in the year of 1996, trading for former LA Ram Jerome Bettis. The Oilers would follow suit and select Eddie George in the draft with a 14th overall pick in 96. In his first ever year, he would rush for 1,368 yards and 8 touchdowns with a 4.1 average yards per carry. George would win Offensive Rookie of the Year that year, and would be a core piece of the Titans for years to come, not, not just with the balance and vision that he provided as a running back, but simply for the ability to just never get injured. Throughout his entire career, he would never miss a single start. The Titans were always sort of a run-first team in this era, which was compounded by the fact that they had a major, major lack of receivers. In fact, one of their leading receivers on the eventual Super Bowl run, and, and throughout the years between their move from Houston to Tennessee, would be their tight end, Frank Wycheck. Wycheck's journey to the team would be interesting, to say the least, and far more up and down than the two before him. Selected in the sixth round of the draft by Washington out of Maryland, the athletic Wycheck was dominant throughout his college career as a tight end. He in fact, fun fact, had seen some snaps at running back for the last two games of his senior season because of a spate of injuries. He had two 100-yard games in that time. However, his time in Washington would not be good at all. Wycheck could rarely crack the rotation of tight ends, and in fact, in his second year, 1994, the team experimented by moving him to fullback, which did not work out. Wycheck would be cut by Washington after that year. In his first season with the Titans, 1995, Wycheck would have the best year of his short career up to that point, 471 yards and a touchdown. He still played some snaps at fullback, albeit a lot less, and got a rushing touchdown that year as well. However, throughout the years, Wycheck would become a major receiving threat in between the tackles, and would be, of course, third on the team in receiving yards, a very close third, which we will get into, by the way, on the way to their Super Bowl run. The core of this team was mostly assembled, but far from ready. Their two biggest problems being receiving and edge pressure. Of course, the Titans were a run-first team, and McNair was able to keep the passing game afloat with his talent. However, the receiving... However, the receivers were still not fantastic, which turned into a problem in a fairly, fairly tight AFC Central at the time, the division usually being a toss-up between Pittsburgh and Jacksonville. But the Titans, even though they were 8-8 eight eight for three straight years, were always, always going to give their divisional opponents a run for their money, but never really get over the top when it mattered. The concerning part about the edge pressure really reared its ugly head in 1998, as the team leader in sacks that year was linebacker Lonnie Martz, who had only four. No, this is no slander on Martz, by the way. He actually had a fantastic year that year, but it's just an example. Moving on, the Titans, in the offseason, would make two major moves to try and rectify those two issues. The first was a signing. They would sign 30-year-old wide receiver Yancey Thigpen, formerly of Pittsburgh, to be their new number one of the future. And in the draft, to help fortify their edge, they would select edge rusher Javon Curse out of Florida. Fun fact about Javon Curse, he would be the first ever draft pick by the now Tennessee Titans. Of course, all the other ones before that had been picked by the Tennessee Oilers. Regular season was soon to begin. And when it did begin, it was clear that this was a different Titans team. Of course, the players were the same, but the team was different. This was the first season under new offensive coordinator Les Steckel as well, and as a result, the offense got much, much better. McNair would only play in 11 games that year, missing those five due to injury, and veteran journeyman Neil O'Donnell would step in for those intervening five games and play fairly well. 1,300 yards, 10 touchdowns, and 5 interceptions were his stat line. Even with missing those 5 games, McNair still threw for 2,100 yards, 12 touchdowns, while rushing for a further 477 yards and 8 touchdowns. Eddie George would have another fantastic year on the ground, with 1,300 yards and 8 touchdowns, averaging 4.1 yards per carry. He would also have 458 yards and 4 touchdowns receiving, and made a Pro Bowl. The biggest weakness on offense, though, was still the receiving core. 
Yancey Thigpen played very, very well until he got injured. He would miss six games that year, with his final stat line ending up being 648 yards and four touchdowns in the regular season. Second year man Kevin Dyson would end up leading the team in receiving yards by virtue of health. He himself only had 658 yards and four touchdowns, while Frank Wycheck grabbed 641 yards and two touchdowns in the of course, on the defensive side of the ball, the main story would be Javon Curse. He had 14 and a half sacks in his rookie year, a record that has still barely been sniffed to this day. He would also be tied for the NFL lead in forced fumbles with eight and have 15 TFLs on the year. The Freak, as he came to be known, would win Defensive Rookie of the Year by a landslide, well deserved. Despite the flaws with the team, the Titans still managed to tighten up and go 13 and 3 on the regular season. The most surprising part about their record though was they did not win their division. The crown of the AFC Central would in fact go to the 14 and 2 Jacksonville Jaguars. But the interesting thing about the Jaguars 14 and 2 record was that both of their losses on the year had come to the Titans. The first being a 20 to 19 thriller that came down to the final play of the game. The second being a 41-14 blowout as Jacksonville was playing all their backups because they had clinched a playoff spot. The 13-3 Titans would have to go into the wild card and then proceed to go on one of the most legendary playoff runs of all time. That run would start with their wild card matchup, the 10-6 Buffalo Bills. But before we get into that game, let's backtrack for a little bit and talk about that Bills team. It had been bad for the Bills since their 0-4 in the Super Bowl run earlier in the decade, and in 98 it was no different. They had traded for quarterback Rob Johnson before the year, and he would go 1-3 as their starter before getting hurt. His replacement, former CFL star Doug Flutie, would go 7-3 as a starter and would end up getting the Bills in the wild card in the first place. However, Flutie would be benched again for the playoffs for Rob Johnson in a highly controversial move by coach Wade Phillips. The game itself would be a defensive slugfest. The Bills would get into a big hole early, as quarterback Rob Johnson would be sacked for a safety. 2-0 Tennessee. Taking that momentum, the Titans would line up for the free kick and return the kick all the way for a touchdown, making it a 9-0 game. At the very end of the first half, Titans kicker Al DeGreco would knock in a field goal, making it the 12-0 lead. However, the Bills would come right back. A 44-yard rush by running back Antoine Smith set up a rushing touchdown by himself later on that drive, making it a 12-7 ball game. The Bills would then get the ball back and score again, but a missed two-point conversion would end up making it a 13-12 lead. The Titans drove down the field but stalled out, settling for only a field goal. 15-13 Titans. There was only 1 minute and 48 seconds left in the game at this point, but the Bills did not go down quietly. They would drive all the way down the field and score a field goal to take the lead with 16 seconds left on the clock. And then, of course, it happened. On the resulting kickoff, one of the most famous plays in NFL history, the Music City Miracle. The Bills would squib kick the ball on the resulting kickoff and it would be scooped up by fullback Lorenzo Neal. Neal would then hand the ball off to Frank Wycheck and the Bills special teams unit closed in on him. Wycheck, seeing this, would lateral the ball out to wide receiver Kevin Dyson, who would then take it 75 yards for the touchdown. With that, with that miracle of a play, no pun intended, the Titans would win the game, 22 to 16. In the divisional round, they would run into another very, very tough foe, the 13 and three Indianapolis Colts, led by Peyton Manning. The offense of the Colts that year was top five in the league. The defense, though, left something to be desired. However, though, the Colts had managed to clinch their division and were coming off of a first round bye in the year. The Titans had played in a slugfest of a wild card game and were walking in against a fresh Colts team. They were 5.5 point underdogs and written off by many before the game even began. This would be another very defensive game. At the end of the first half, the score was 9-6 in favor of the Colts. Then, Eddie George happened. On the third play of the Titans' first drive of the third quarter, he would take the ball and run 68 yards for a touchdown. 
After a few more stalled drives by both teams, the Titans would go all the way down the field but kick a field goal, making it 16-9. But the Colts, you know? The Colts had one of the best offenses in the league and one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time under center. They would score, wouldn't they? Luck and the football gods were on the Titans' side that day, as the Colts would make several critical errors that would change the pace of the game. First off, wide receiver Jerome Payton dropped a deep ball from Peyton Manning where he was wide open. It would have been a massive game. On a punt return later on in the game, Indianapolis return man Terrence Wilkins seemed to take the punt 87 yards for the score, putting Indy back in the game. However, on the replay, it showed he stepped out of bounds. Indy's drive stalled out there as well. And then on another drive later in the game, future Hall of Fame wide receiver Marvin Harrison would drop a critical pass on third down, leading to the Colts to punt. They stalled out. They beat themselves in a lot of ways. The Titans would score another field goal late, making the score 19-9 with a few minutes left. The Colts, though, finally got into the end zone going all the way down the field and scoring on a 15-yard scramble by Peyton Manning to make the score 19-16. But the comeback season would be over. The Titans would win and go on to the AFC Championship. In the AFC Championship, the Titans would be facing an old enemy, but an enemy they knew how to beat, Jacksonville. The Jags' offense that year was dominant, led by the quarterback Mark Brunel, underrated running back Fred Taylor, and twin underrated receivers Keenan McCardell and Jimmy Smith, along with a fantastic O-line, headlined by the tragically short career of one Tony Baselli. Jacksonville's offense would propel them to an early lead, but it was far from a secure one. It was 14-10 going into the half. Then, Tennessee's defense stepped up in the second half and showed out for the rest of the game. After Mark Brunel was picked off in the end zone by safety Marcus Robertson, the Titans would drive all the way down the field and score a touchdown, giving them their first lead of the game, 17 to 14. After that point, it was almost over. The Titans defense took that momentum and ran with it. They would sack Mark Brunel twice, the first one for a safety, and on the resulting free kick after the safety, the Titans would run back another free kick for a touchdown in the playoffs. Wide receiver Derek Mason scoring from 80 yards out. The Titans now had a 26-14 lead. And after a few more stalled and ended drives by Jacksonville, the offense of Tennessee would put the game away after a 51-yard rush by Steve McNair set up a one-yard rushing touchdown by McNair. The final score would be 33-14, Tennessee. The Titans were going to the Super Bowl. The Titans had clawed all the way from the wild card to make it to the big dance, and their opponent was no slouch in their own right. However, that will be saved for part two of this series. I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe and all that good stuff. I swear to God, I am going to upload more consistently because this story is fun and interesting and I want to, yeah, I want to upload more consistently. All right. And with that, it's Jackson Kane signing off. Deuces.